If you're uncertain about what you're doing and you don't know if you should change course, set yourself the obligation to choose something more difficult before you change course. Because there's a moral hazard, right? It's like, well, am I, am I unhappy or am I just useless? It's like, well, a little of column A and a little of column B. Well, how do I fortify myself against my uselessness? I don't allow myself to switch course unless the challenge increases. And that works, you know, it's a, it's a check against your own laziness and inertia and envy and resentment. Because you know then too, you can say to yourself, well, I, I moved from there, I didn't fail, I didn't quit, I chose something more difficult. And so I can have some faith in my choice. Maybe, maybe I can have some faith in my choice. Because you accepted a bigger challenge. had said the reason we think is so that we can let our thoughts die instead of us so imagine you have a stupid idea which is highly probable right just imagine you might have 50 of them a day Many. so then you think well let's go act out that stupid idea which is what you do if you're an impulsive and so you act out the stupid idea and you get just walloped by the world and maybe you die well so what's an alternative well why don't you throw your stupid idea out on the table to a bunch of other people and say well, I have this idea, and I'm kind of thinking about acting it out. Is it stupid? And you maybe you're prideful about your idea because, you know, you're attracted by it, and you thought it up, whatever that means, and so now you're glued to it, plus it tiles something for you, so you're invested in it. And you don't want it to be a stupid idea, but then, like, well, fine, do you want to die? Or do you want you to let your idea die? And so a lot of what we do in dialogue is kill stupid ideas. And we do that so we don't act them out, and we... Don't want to act them out because then we die. And this even works biologically. So the part of your brain that generates thought grew out of the part of your brain that you use to voluntarily control your actions. So you could say a thought is a potential action. People think a thought is a representation of the world. It's like, yeah, not fundamentally. Fundamentally, a thought is a potential action. So then in your imagination, you make avatars of yourself. So that's you in your imagination. What if I did this? It's a little avatar of yourself. You think, what if I did this? Here's the world. I, I act like this. These good things happen. That's my vision. Then you throw your vision on the table and you say, well, I have this vision. And you say, well, that's a stupid vision because you didn't take this into account. And how are you going to do that? And you think, oh, that sucks because I had this vision. Mm -hmm. But, well, thank you because I didn't see those snakes, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And then it's tricky because maybe you're mad because I had a vision and you don't have one. And so you're pissed off about that. And so you're just attacking my vision because, yeah. you know, you don't have anything better to do. I, and I've had this conversation with someone before where a kid told me he wanted like a million followers on social media. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, but that's not going to happen, though. Mm -hmm. Like, not for you. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Because I knew because I had the experience, you know, and then I had that moment where they basically freaked out right yeah well you, you shatter a dream absolutely eh? yeah. well so a dream is a tile of the future mm -hmm. so you say what's the future well you don't know well here's a vision so that's now it's a tile mm -hmm. and then it covers the future and it also covers it in a pleasing way yeah. and then you come along and say you know it's a little low risk well you could say to someone who wants that are you sure you want a million followers you know because people say i'd be happy if i had 400 million dollars it's like you think you could handle that responsibility, do you? Like, you're so sure of that, that all of a sudden you'd have all this money dumped on your... You can't even control your household budget. Mm -hmm. You live from paycheck to paycheck. Now you, somebody's going to dump a treasure on your steps, and that's going to fix your life. It's like, okay, how much are you going to give to your relatives? Like, none? Mm -hmm. Oh, that'll work out real well. Too much? So then you're going to take away their responsibility from them, are you? Mm -hmm. And you're going to get that balance exactly right. And then what are you going to do with that money? Because as soon as you got the money, the parasites are going to come in and take your money. Well, the average family fortune lasts three generations. Mm -hmm. That's all. There's a mythological trope that's very useful in understanding this. I presume that most of the people watching and listening have watched The Lion King. The Lion King has a very very solid narrative structure. It's a very smart movie, like many of the Disney movies. And people criticize me because I'm so interested in Disney movies, but I'm interested in anything that many, 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 many people watch for a long time. Because, mm. well, what's going on there? Why is that so attractive? 
and often a movie's attractive because it gets the story right and the characters right, whatever that means. Well, The Lion King was a very, very successful animated movie, one of the most successful can movies I, of can, all time. Can I just... Yes. Well, for those who can't remember, everything the light touches is our kingdom. Right, I can tell you exactly what that means. Uh, that That's a brilliant line. Mm. And that's also... And notice I used the word brilliant, mm. and brilliant is associated with the idea of the light. Okay, so now, the, when the light touches something and you see it, then you establish a relationship with the thing that you see because now you start to understand it. And the more lit up something is, the more you're, you can understand it and explore it. And so when you shine a light into dark crevices, then let's say, then you start to see what's in the dark crevices. And if you go around your apartment building, let's say, and you pay attention to every nook and cranny, you start to, it starts to become yours in a very fundamental way. And so you could say, well, light is equivalent to consciousness. That's a good way of thinking about it. Now, why? Well, we're very visual creatures, human beings. Our brains are organized on vision. Most animals are organized on smell, by the way, but not us. We're organized on vision. A huge part of our cortical activity is devoted to, to sight. And so we think of sight as enlightenment, light. We think of it as illumination, right? When we bring something into the light, we improve it. And so we associate the day with consciousness and illumination and enlightenment. And so if you attend to something by shining a light on it, then it becomes yours. And so your kingdom is actually everything that the light of your consciousness is shone on. And all that's encapsulated in that statement. And that's why it's stuck in your imagination. <laughs> yeah, you remember he's up, he's up with his son on, yeah. a, on a mountain, right, on a cliff. And yeah. so now think about that. That means he can see a long way. And then he sees this this circle of the world mm -hmm. and the light shining on it. And he says, everything the light shines on is our kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then that also implies that, and he says that next, that outside the light, there's another kingdom. And that's the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. And that's the place that hasn't been explored. And if you remember in the movie, that's where, that's where the fascists are mm -hmm. and the hyenas and the hyenas are predatory. Mm -hmm. And so when Simba goes out past the domain of the light, he enters the unknown and he enters the, the underworld, the demonic underworld, and that's Scar. Now back to Scar. Okay, so, so Simba has Mustafa as his father. And Mustafa's the positive aspect of the, of the patriarchy. And he's wise and he's tough. He's got a set face. He's no pushover. But he has an evil brother, and that's Scar. And Scar has been scarred. And that's why he's resentful, right? He's a victim. And, and he feel, he's a victim because his brother gets all the attention, like Cain in relationship to Abel. And he's a victim because, for some reason, we don't quite he's understand. He's smaller. He's smaller, he's but he's alpha. intellectual too, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So he's got the he's got Luciferian he's got the Luciferian pride in intellect. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy Irons, who is that character, played that extremely well with that kind of unctuous voice that was kind of uh, like a snaky sound droning you, so. yeah well and also uh, contemptuous and mm. and presumptuous and narcissistic he did a lovely job of that and so now you might say well why does the king have an evil uncle or an evil brother well the, the answer is this is the mythological answer is that well the king always has an evil brother always and the reason for that is if the king is the emblem of the state which, or even of the stable state of being, because you can think about it psychologically or sociologically, he always has a counterpart. And the counterpart is the proclivity of that state to be overtaken by willful blindness. So failure to shine a light on things, right? To turn your fate head away when you know you shouldn't. And also by this corrupt will to resentful power. Mm -hmm. And that's chronic. Now the Marxist would say, and do in some real sense, there's nothing but scar. There's nothing but the evil uncle. It's like, that's a hell of a worldview. I can tell you in some real sense, it's akin on the Christian front to making the statement that the true ruler of reality is the satanic spirit. It's the same idea. And that's a hell of a claim, man, to, to, to literally speaking. And so, but, but it is the case that almost every institution and almost every person has a touch of the evil uncle as part of their structure. Pride is the opposite of humility and humility is the precondition for learning. Mm -hmm. And you know, you might say, that's partly why humility is something that was practiced say by genuinely religious people as a virtue because the idea would be to open yourself up like a child. 
you know, how open a child is to learning. Well, the child doesn't assume he or she knows everything already. Mm -hmm. They're just looking around all the time, which is one of the things so remarkable about children. They're just looking around all the time at everything <laughs> they don't know. And with, a, with a, like an infant, that's just, they're just like this all the time, mm -hmm. wondering what yeah. in the world's going on and trying to learn. And so pride stops learning.